This audio presentation of The Sun Papers, number 39, The Son of Man, is brought to you by Christ Consciousness Channel, copyright 2023, all rights reserved. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the one end of heaven to the other. Matthew 24, 29-31 In view of what was stated in the previous paper about the tribulations of the present time, being the ones referred to by Jesus and quoted from an earlier part of the same chapter of Matthew, we wish now to consider his words above. We will first point you to what he says in the 34th and 35th verses following. Verily I say unto you, this generation, meaning this age, for we know it did not take place in the generation succeeding Jesus, shall not pass, till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Remember these are Jesus' actual words. They are His promises very solemnly impressed upon His disciples, and we cannot but accept that they will come true. We will assume, therefore, that these days of tribulation through which we are passing are the last days to which He referred, which except they be shortened, there will be no flesh saved. But we know they will be shortened, for the elect's sake, and we will also assume that the elect, His true disciples now on earth, are fleeing to the mountains of the Spirit, and will abide there, and await the appearance of the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Before this sign appears, he says that the sun and moon will be darkened, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. We will try to convey to you what this means, but first it will be necessary to tell you that what man sees with his mortal eyes and what appears to be the sun, moon, and stars of the heavens, and also what seems to be the earth, are not what he understands them to be in his mortal mind. They are but symbols or his mental concepts of great realities that exists in the inner realms of spirit, but not in the outer world of the physical. We make this clearer in the article on the one mind that follows herein, but we now ask you to consider that when rising into the Christ consciousness, fleeing into the mountains, we leave the physical world altogether and enter a realm where there are no sun, moon, stars, or other powers of the heavens all these will have passed away. The light of our own souls in that realm suffices. Then what is more natural than to assume that after the tribulations are over, and the descent of the kingdom begins, the first thing to be noticed by all those still in mortal consciousness will be the unusual darkness caused by the seeming withdrawal of the light from all material sources, as well as the shaking or disruption of the supposed powers of the heavens. Then in the darkness will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. A great and wondrous light will appear, such as was never before seen upon earth, causing all men to lament, fearing they know not what. And then, out of this light amidst the clouds of heaven, will come forth the Son of Man, with all the power and glory of His kingdom about Him, and surrounded by great hosts of angels. In other words, Jesus Christ, as the Son of Man, after causing his sign to appear, will send his angels with loud trumpeting to gather his elect from the four corners of the kingdom, and they with the great beings and angels from the celestial realms will form the great army of light spoken of in the preceding paper, who will be seen in all their great power and glory bringing the light of heaven right down upon the earth. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall sit the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. And shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. 
These shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. We do not wish to speak now of the Lord's judgment of those that remain, but rather of the manner of His coming and what it means. In order to make clear to your understanding its true meaning, it will be necessary to quote some of Paul's statements regarding this great event, for he seems to have had a revelation concerning it. He said, Behold, I show you a mystery, or secret. We shall not all sleep or die, but we shall all be changed in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 1 Corinthians 15, 51-2 Also in 1 Thessalonians, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep or are dead, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, or who are in their Christ consciousness on the soul plane, having discarded their mortal bodies or died, will God bring with him, with Jesus. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep or are dead. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ, those dead but in their Christ consciousness, where they have joined with him on the soul plane, shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever afterward be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13-17 In other words, those of us conscious disciples of Christ who are still alive in the flesh will rise out of our mortal consciousness into our Christ consciousness and shall be with them and the Lord therein ever afterward. In reality, as shown in the preceding paper, will that consciousness then rule on earth through our Lord, Jesus Christ, who will sit upon the throne of His glory, and those of us who are in that consciousness with Him will rule under Him and teach the nations the laws and principles of the Christ life. But what we would have you understand is that not all who are alive will be in that consciousness, for as Jesus says, there will then be gathered before Him all nations that are left and he shall separate them one from another, the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. To those on his right hand he will say, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. And then he explained that, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Those on his right hand will be the children of the kingdom, those, no matter what their religion, color, or race, who believe in a supreme being and in their hearts worship and ever seek to please and serve him by being kind and helpful to their fellows, or no matter how much they are deemed to be heathens, barbarians, unworthy or ignorant, by those looking to the priesthood for their authority. These we, their elder brothers, will teach the mysteries of Christ, which have been hidden through the ages from the wise, but then will be made plain, so that all the world may know. You can easily see that among all the peoples of the world, the elect, the true disciples of Christ, are very few in number, and that they as elder brothers must be the leaders, the teachers, guides, helpers and protectors of the different nations of their younger brothers who will then be under their care. In a way, many of us realize now our true mission in being here at this particular time and are doing all we can to teach and prepare for the new age, those who come to us for light and help. Many are coming into the light these days, as the truth is taught them and their former errors are uncovered and made plain, and they are repenting and aligning themselves on the side of Christ and of righteousness. These, if they endure unto the end, will be among those who are left after the tribulations and who will sit on the right hand of the Lord. Those who persist in their selfishness and unrighteousness, who rebel and refuse to acknowledge and obey the Spirit of God in their hearts, and who are permitted to endure to the end, will be placed on the left hand of the Lord. These shall go away into everlasting, or age-lasting, or end-of-the-age, according to the Greek text, punishment, 
but the righteous unto eternal immortal life. In other words, as stated in Revelation 20, they lived not again until the thousand years had finished, but the righteous will become immortal souls. But what we wish you particularly to note is the distinction between the elect, those already living in their Christ consciousness, and those who are their younger brothers, and who will be under their care and guidance. We have told you how these children in Christ will gradually be brought by their elder brothers to the maturity of their Christ understanding until they too attain the full stature of Christ. Of the elder brothers, the same chapter of Revelation states, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, those who ascend at Christ's coming and meet him in their Christ consciousness. On them the second death, they no longer have anything to die, hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. You who are receiving these impersonal teachings and who have learned to know the Christ in your hearts, the Comforter, and are waiting upon and serving him there, are the children of the kingdom and who, if you endure to the end or not, will be a part of the kingdom of the new age. But you who have entered the Christ consciousness and know your identity as a son of God, your oneness with Christ and the Father, you are of those who will have part in the first resurrection and will meet the Lord in the air and will descend with him to establish his kingdom upon the earth. Can you not now see what we have been preparing you for, helping all whose own higher selves were urging them to follow with us to the end, to the kingdom which we all started out to reach? This is the goal to enable you consciously to enter the kingdom by way of the Christ consciousness. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, so that you will be one of those to meet the Lord in the air, in that consciousness, when he comes. Some of you have entered that consciousness and are more or less able to enter it at will and to abide in it for a time. Many of you are on the verge of entering, are passing through the cleansing fires of the tribulations, and are having the last vestiges of self burned away are actually going through your crucifixion. These earnest ones, if they endure to the end, will surely be saved, and we urge that you spend much of your time from now on in prayer, striving to hear and obey no voice but Christ's. To those who have permitted doubts, discouragement, and fear of failure to enter the mind because of no seeming evidence of attainment despite their earnest efforts, know that you are but succumbing to the enemy, who alone has instilled such thoughts into your minds in order to weaken and stop you. Will you yield thus to him, forgetting all the help, inspiration, and proof of him whom you have been following and serving when so near the goal? Can you not realize that this may be but the final test of your desire and determination to win the kingdom? The disciple is always tested and reached through the weakest part of his nature. The enemy knows just where that is, and he always plays on that part until, if possible, he weakens the resistance of other parts and thereby demoralizes the mind and through it the will. Are you going to let him play with you in this way? We give you this caution now so that you may understand what it all means and will carry on. Many of you are those who never heard a definite voice, who have had no tangible evidence of an inner life or of actual guidance, or who all their lives have fruitlessly longed for a glimpse of the Master's face and to feel His presence. But hear what dear words of comfort Jesus says to such, Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Therefore halt not your efforts. It is not what you have experienced and is accredited by your human mind, but what you are in your heart that counts. Just know that if your whole heart, mind, and soul are set on finding the kingdom, nothing in heaven, earth, or hell can prevent your finding it and being one of those who will enter and dwell in it in the new age, so that it is really unimportant if a disciple wins the kingdom while in his physical body or if he loses his physical body. For it is not his real body, and in the new conditions and higher vibrations that will manifest in the near future, his beautiful and perfect soul body will be the only one visible, and he will no longer have any use for the old physical body. From what has been said, can you not see that the real meaning of those who endure to the end being the ones who will be saved does not refer to the saving of their physical bodies? For did not Jesus say, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you? Then it must refer to those who will endure to the end in a perfect faith and trust in God or in Christ, 
despite anything that may happen to them in the outer. They alone will be saved for the new age. They are the sheep, the steadfast ones whom none can deceive or destroy, not meaning that all such will be killed, for all conscious disciples will be able to free themselves from their captors, even as did Jesus, Peter, and Paul. See Luke 4.30, John 8.59 and 10.39, Acts 12, 6 to 11, 27, 23 to 44. We might add that in this new and higher grade of the Aquarian age, when the Christ consciousness will rule, it will be an exact reversal of present conditions. Then the heaven and the real world will be the only one visible on earth, while what is at present visible will become invisible, because of being on a lower vibration on another plane of consciousness. Therefore, with Paul we say, Beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for inasmuch as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The Lord of peace himself give you peace always. The Lord be with you all. The one mind. The one mind is everywhere. If you can but know it, it is not only in the air, pressing up against your face, your arms, your body, but it is the intelligence holding the atoms of your body together. It is also the consciousness of the cells of your body that knows just what to do to make every organ, nerve, or muscle, of which they are a part, function perfectly, if let alone. Knows just what to take from the blood what is needed to build bone, flesh, fat, nerves, tissue, hair, nails, etc. It is likewise the intelligence directing the birth, growth, decay, and death of all mineral, vegetable, and animal life expression. Directing also the actual existence of all inanimate objects, such as a chair, a house, or an automobile. For did not the minds of men first conceive the ideas to build these objects? And did they not receive these ideas from the one mind? Think, this one mind is not only in all men and all things, but contains all men and all things within itself, explaining the meaning of Paul's statement that, in him we live, move, and have our being or that in God's mind we and all things live, move and have our being. You can easily understand this when you realize that in your mind, your whole world and everything in it have their being. For your world is in fact composed only of your concepts, ideas, or thought pictures of what you think are outside of you in the so-called physical world, when in reality there is no actual physical world. That is only your mind's interpretation of the sources of the vibrations continually reported to you by your five senses. The real things you see, hear, feel, etc. are the concepts, ideas, and pictures you have formed in your mind of what you think exist outside of your particular center of consciousness and which live, move, and have their being only in the world of your mind. Even as we and all things in the reality of our perfect being exist in God's mind. We recite all this in order to show you that all is mind, that everything is operating in mind, and in mind only. And therefore mind being everywhere, and of course knowing all things, and hence being all-powerful, because of its vast knowledge naturally it must operate in perfect and continuous harmony. It could not be otherwise in such an all-wise and all-perfect mind. Go over the above carefully and ponder on each sentence until its full meaning becomes clear in your mind and it thus gets in harmony with the one mind. Do not try too hard at first to grasp the truth of the statement that in reality there is no actual physical world, for that will come to you later without effort, when the other truths are fully realized. But try to see how everything takes place first in mind, that it is always first an idea in some man's mind, coming forth into it from the one mind, before it seemingly outmanifests in the so-called physical world. Then, if you will turn back to our first two statements and grasp the fact that the one mind is also in the air pressing up against your body and against all bodies, as well as is in all bodies, you can easily see that what we call out manifesting in the physical world is but a further coming forth of ideas out of man's mind into the outermost strata of mind or into the visibility of material form in the same way that they first come forth from the innermost of the one mind into man's mind and finally push through into the physical realm of being. But man's mind being between the innermost and the outermost can easily, or should be able easily, to connect itself with either by knowing its oneness with both 
through the realization that there is in actuality only one mind. Through a perfect realization of this truth, it instantly becomes attuned to the one mind and is able perfectly to control the manifestation of its ideas in the outermost, as well as to receive whatever ideas it needs from the innermost. On the other hand, when man's mind forgets or through ignorance does not know its part in the one mind, it soon gets involved in its ideas in the outermost which become crystallized there. And man is thus bound and held by those ideas and it is impossible to free himself, his consciousness, from them, until the light from the one mind again is able to penetrate through into man's mind, showing him what has befallen him. Now try to see that everything including man is an avenue of expression of the one mind. No is not an expression of that mind, for the innermost can only express in the outermost through man's mind. Therefore what seemingly is expressing in the outermost is man's ideas of what are expressing to him from the innermost, but always colored and shaped by man's consciousness of separation from or his identity with the one mind. When man's mind is perfectly attuned to the consciousness of the one mind, the full light or knowing of that mind can then shine through from the innermost to the outermost, and thereby will man shape his ideas in the outer according to the perfection of the inner that he sees there. Our chief desire is to have you realize that the one mind is ever seeking your complete realization of the goodness and perfection of its ideas, and that especially at this time is pouring its light with great power into the minds of men, so that all who are in any way attuned to its consciousness are receiving a rich abundance of its ideas as never before in the history of the world. Likewise is the sense of separation the veil that prevents the light of perfect knowing from shining through in its fullness, getting so thin and transparent that many minds are becoming aware of the inner world of the kingdom, are seeing the beauty, goodness, and perfection of everything and everyone there, and are more or less living in its consciousness. Can you feel that mind everywhere about you, as the mind that is in you and in everybody, is all-knowing, all-loving, and all-powerful, that it therefore knows your every need, loves you with an all-encompassing love, and ever wishes to express in and through you the fullness of its nature and all the goodness and riches of its knowing and being? Think of that mind as ever pressing from within against your mind, seeking to include and unite your consciousness with its consciousness, so that you not only may receive of the fullness of its spiritual blessings, but that you may become a perfect channel of expression so that these blessings can come forth into manifestation in your outer life and affairs. Remember these blessings are everywhere about you, but are invisible to your human mind only because you think your mind is separate and not a part of the one mind, where all good and perfect things are eternally present and ever visible. When how could they be separate when that mind is actually your mind? Ah, dear one, if we could only get you to realize fully this great truth, that that mind, the only mind, is indeed your mind, that it knows everything, possesses within itself every desirable thing, always loves you, and always wants you to have the best of everything, to have and be all that it has and is, and that the only thing that is hindering is your mind, its beliefs, its sense of lack and limitation and of being separate. Seeing this, Cannot you then let go with your mind? Give up that foolish belief and let the one mind have its way entirely with you? To let go is to desire nothing anymore and to resist nothing, to give your consciousness over wholly to it, to care for nothing only that you are no longer hindering its expression in and through you. That is all you need do. You must try to do nothing of yourself, only what it presses you to do or say. It will do this always out of a great love, so that you may know its will for you. No more must you rebel against anything, nor refuse whatever is placed before you to do. But instead you must let go, turn within, and let the loving mind there show you what to do and how to do it. Ever seek to keep strong hold on those old impulses of your mind that would from habit start to say or do something out of the old sense of self, of lack and limitation, and of separation. It is from such impulses that all trouble and inharmony spring. When the mind ever seeks to be united with its source, to be directed and used by it, can you not see from what is shown above that only goodness, harmony, peace and happiness must result? 
When there is only one mind, the beauty, goodness, and perfection of the within must come into the without, for they are always pressing against man's mind seeking to express through it their only medium of expression, so that the without may be united with the within and the kingdom of heaven may actually manifest upon earth. Let us sum up the practical application of the above. If it is a matter of healing, remember that as the one mind sees and knows you, you or your patient are perfect now and always have been. It is your mind that must stop thinking differently. It must also stop forcefully trying to see perfection, and instead you need only to direct the mind's attention within to the one mind, life, God, whichever is easier for you, and then let go. This releases your mind from the influence of the impressions from outer physical sensations and their mental pictures, and leaves the one mind free to reveal the purity and perfection of your true nature, to come forth and possess your consciousness, and express forth and be your true self. When the mind is perfectly still and is turned within expectant, the channel is open, and the one life can then come forth freely through your consciousness unto perfect manifestation. You can see that will apply in a similar way to where there is a consciousness of lack or limitation of finances. As all things come from the one mind, and that mind is in everyone, wherever there is a need it is felt by that mind, and when your channel is open, unimpeded by fear, doubts, or worry, it will surely fulfill that need. When you know the truth, the truth will make you free. When you always act in that truth. We are approaching another Easter time the time of resurrection, when the soul is given additional opportunity of freeing itself from the control of the flesh and its sense of separation and of lifting the consciousness of its human mind into oneness with its soul consciousness, where it may actually see and be with the Lord and its soul companions of the kingdom in the air. Let every disciple strive during Lent to put self and its claims wholly aside, allowing the Christ to rule in every thought, word, and act. This means that even the desire to attend the Easter services in the Spirit must yield to Him, for surely He knows of such desire and wishes and purposes that you shall attend, when self's longings no longer interfere and permit it. Think this over and try to place yourself altogether in His hands, making your mind an empty channel into which He can pour His consciousness.